So there's an outline which continues on the next slide. So I'll start with uh, some background material from certain aspects of, or rather, uh, uh, specific approach to stochastic approximation algorithms. It's also a short commercial for the my main activity. And then this is a spin-off, distributed algorithms. We talk about the various types and there's some currently popular area about federated learning, which I'll just touch upon. Essentially a special case. And th this is the, some, the sort of more extended part of the talk. We'll talk about this mo model from John Sisiklis' PAD thesis this, and uh, many extensions thereof. So more a survey talk, and it's not, uh, not necessarily my work. we we'll start from the beginning and go through various stages of the theme. Okay, so let me quickly run through stochastic approximation of the robbins mundro algorithm. So the original motivation came from statistics. They wanted to solve, find the zero of some nonlinear function H given noisy measurements. So what you, you have some black box given X, is, it spits out HX plus some noise. And um, the idea is to solve for HX equal to zero. And a clever idea they came up with is a sort of iterative scheme, but with a slowly decreasing step size. So you use the step size n in machine learning, it's called, I think, uh, learning parameters. I forget some, some such thing, but yeah, it goes back to Robinson and Monroe. So the algorithm is just a simple iteration, xn plus 1 is xn plus n times the noisy measurement. And the conditions on n is that the sum of n should be infinity and uh, sum of n square should be finite. And uh, mn I'll assume to be a martingale difference sequence. That means it's just one step conditional expectation given the history till time n is uh, zero. Probably didn't mean, mention anywhere, but theta is the zero vector. And uh, as I already said, the important thing to notice, uh, to remember is that it, this square bracket is what you measure. You don't know HXN and MN plus one separately. Otherwise the algorithm wouldn't be needed. And uh, yeah. And also the other observation I want to make is that it, it looks like just some additive noise model, but it's more general because most algorithms come in this form. They're not additive noise. Because uh, xi n plus 1 is some iid random variable, but you can put it in that form by just adding and sub subtracting one step conditional expectation. So just uh, define h of x to be expected value over uh, the noise xi, keeping the first argument fixed, and then subtract it from the actual right hand side, and that gives you a martingale difference sequence. So you can always put algorithms in that form. Again, uh, there's a, historically the original approach of Robbins Mandro and several people who followed up was purely probabilistic and uh, something which came close on the heels of this, this Robbins Mandro paper was a paper which is hard to find by Sigmund and Robbins, which introduced a sort of extension of Martingale convergence theorem. It appears in Noah's book as almost super Martingales. The paper is hard to find because it's in some proceedings. But uh, this result is now in our textbook material so that you can find easily. Now, uh, what I'm going to sort of advocate is an alternative approach which started in Russia, there, but then uh, in, I think, 73, 74, or actually Mirko was even before, and it was developed more fully by Leonard Leung in 77, and after several years of development, a final kind of uh, crowning achievement or whatever it did to Michel Benheim in a 90s, in 1996 paper in SAM control, which gives a very complete kind of characterization of what is possible. I will mention one of his main results here. So the idea is to treat this iteration as a, as a noisy Euler scheme. So Euler scheme is just a discretization, xn plus one is xn plus some small a times hxn. The two differences is that uh, A is not fixed, it's a slowly decreasing step size and there's noise. So noisy discretization of the differential equation x dot t equal to hxt. Okay. So you expect that under reasonable conditions, they should have similar asymptotic behavior. And that's what you use to analyze the algorithm. So what one does is to first define what I would call algorithmic time scale, define t0 at zero, think of A in as a time step. 
So T0 is 0 and then Tn is just sum of am till n minus 1. And then consider the continuous and piecewise linear interpolation. So this x bar t is the function of t greater than or equal to 0, which is at x bar Tn is equal to xn. So I match it with the iterates and in between just uh, make it piecewise linear, linear and continuous. You just interpolate. So I want to compare that with this differential equation, which is which has a superscript s, which is the initial time. So I consider shifting. Uh, uh, basically, I consider shifting time windows. So consider x dot s t is h of x s t, and x s at time s is matched with x bar s. I mean, you cannot if you compare the interpolated trajectory with the differential equation just from the fixed initial condition, the errors will accumulate. You compare them over a sliding window. So, so let me repeat. So x bar t is the interpolated uh, interpolation of the iterates using this tn as the sort of time points, and um, x s t is a differential equation trajectory. I'm assuming the differential equation is well posed. Started at time s, so that the initial conditions match at time s. So I'm considering the process from s onwards. And then using Grunwald inequality, one can show that uh, on a moving window, they approach each other in the next one. Okay. And uh, rough idea is, so because n sum of n square is finite, n is going to zero. So the discretization errors can be shown to go to zero. And sum of n square less than infinity is the important condition because under suitable hypothesis, for example, if the martingale difference sequence was bounded, which is uh, sometimes you have, uh, some algorithm is true, but uh, usually you have to work harder to manage this step. But suppose it was bounded, then that uh, the sum over n from 1 to capital N of a n, m, n plus 1 is a martingale. So because sum of n square is finite, and if m, uh, the martingale difference sequence was bounded, this martingale would have a quadratic variation which converges. That's enough to say that uh, the martingale itself converges almost surely. And therefore, its tail goes to zero. So this is the tail of the martingale from n to infinity. And I can do that because I know it's converging. And now if you do the error analysis, the discretization error, just do the usual computation, you get something over the, the finite window, which is the order of sum of ai square, which is going to zero anyway from some time in onwards. And the martingale error also goes to zero. Around that. No, that would be even better, but that's not true because the n is multiplying both. Yeah. So it can be of the same order, but uh, because there's some martingale, it's like sort of. Can you show the x bar huh? Just a linear interpolation from between xn and xn plus one. So at tn is xn, at tn plus one is xn plus one. I just join them by line. No, this is almost sure. No, concentration is one can also prove concentration inequalities for to capture the finite time behavior, but right now I'm just talking about uh, convergence. So, this, uh, this martingale will uh, basically this sum of over n of a n mn plus one less than infinity actually is kind of bad notation. What I mean is that the uh, sum from n to capital n converges almost surely. So the, the usual thing is, this is uh, this usually square integral martingale. So if the quadratic variation is almost surely bounded, then the martingale converges. Okay, so now we can see the intuition behind the ODE approach. The sum of n equal to infinity implies that uh, tn is going to infinity. So you are covering, you, are, you want to track the asymptotic behavior of the differential equation. So you are covering the entire time axis. Okay, so this is some jargon. So, an in, okay, well, first thing is, uh, is invariant set. So, invariant set of a differential equation is the set so that if you initiate the differential equation, initialize the differential equation at some point in that set, it remains in that set both in forward and backward. Because the bidirectional is important. And it's said to be chain transitive if that picture holds. So, given n points, we take some endpoints in the invariant set. 
So this is say x and y. Sorry, given two points x and y, I can find some finitely many points. So given x y in the invariant set and some epsilon in capital T. Okay, epsilon small. I can find this finite mean collection of points so that if I start with an, I just draw these epsilon balls, then there are trajectories, OD trajectories of duration greater than or equal to T so that I can start from here, go here and so on. So the modulo some small jumps, you can go from anywhere to anywhere. That's the rough idea. This is actually introduced by some uh, person called Conley in dynamical systems theory, which Benheim adapted for stochastic approximation and the general uh, general limit result is uh, i think the best known till date is that xn converges almost surely to an internally chained transitive invariant set of the differential equation now yes yeah, so usually this is the general theory but usually you are luck, at least your intentions are more narrow you want to converge uh, con algorithm to converge to some point so you uh, you design the edge Okay, and so in, suppose the only possible omega limit sets for the differential equation are say, isolated equilibria. And I'll, I shall assume that the equilibria are hyperbolic in the sense that if I linearize, the, take the Jacobian of H at the equilibrium, the, there's no eigenvalue on the imaginary axis. So then the other picture works here. So there's this, uh, there's a stable manifold so this is the maybe I should give a different color here. This is stable manifold. So if you are on, this corresponds to the stable eigenvalues, which are the real part on the negative complex plane. So here, if you are on that manifold, you will converge. And there's an unstable manifold corresponding to the unstable eigenvalues where you diverge. And the, the reason I draw this picture is this, the important observation that you converge only if you are exactly on the stable manifold. Even if you are slightly away, you, you will move away. So generically, you move away. And there are this avoidance of track results which tell you that your noise is rich enough. And you have to put some condition on the noise. It should not be, say, zero uh, in the transversal direction. If there's enough noise to kick you away from the stable manifold, with probability one, you will avoid unstable equilibria. And this is very useful. The first result was by Robin Pimentel in mid-90s. Then there have been multiple variants of it. Yeah. yeah. This was a subsequent work in machine learning theory, which is quite interesting. If even if you see this tells you avoid local maxima uh, for a uh, minimization problem, you uh, avoid local maxima and saddle points. But uh, nevertheless, the gradient becomes slow when you are close to them, and therefore the algorithm can slow down. So they have some more precise ways of speeding it up so that it will escape the saddle point fast. So some work on that. No, this is a saddle position now. No, yeah. So if there's no um, uh, uh, no stable manifold, it will be a pure uh, whatever about source. And uh, uh, good thing is that usually the desired equilibria for uh, algorithms are stable. Though there may be stable equilibria which are not desired. So, one, for example, minimization, there may be local minima you don't want, but global minimum is certainly an equilibrium. Okay, so th these are the references. Anyway, I think I'll leave the slides with you. You have them anyway. So, in case anyone wants to follow this up, these are the primary references of Benheim, and I have some kind of a advanced text which gives a more pedagogic treatment of this. So let, let me start on the distributed synchronous algorithm. So the process or agent sitting on different nodes of a graph and uh, script V is the node set and with some cardinality N say and script T is the S set and the usual notation IJ is an H from I to J. And the idea is that uh, ith node computes X, I, N based on some delayed information from other nodes. So right now I'll consider a complete graph. I'll drop that later. So the superscript refers to the processor or the node or the agent. So there is n concurrent e equations. The okay, so there are two things. One is the, so that not every node is computing something at each time, and secondly, there are delays in communication. 
So this tau one I, uh, the tau ij n are the delays, and uh, so I have taken a scalar case because it's easier to write. But uh, x x i n for each i can be a vector in general, and y n is the set of nodes which uh, updated its computation at time n. Okay, so indicator i in so if i is in y n, you do the whole uh, that indicator is one and you do the computation. If i is not in y n, that indicator is zero and x i n plus one is same as x i n. Nothing happens. The set, set of nodes which uh, update did updates at time n. So I'm not assuming that all components are updated at time n. Because the previous slide, what is I didn't draw any picture. Some some connected, undirected graph. Yeah. So actually, it can be directed also, but uh, yeah. Xin is this sum function. Xin is the iteration at at node n. At node n, somebody is sitting there and computing Xin. Based on what he hears from neighbors, and at each time, and not everybody computes. So y n is the indices which did their computation at time n. Every point, the person has an R D value. Yeah. So I explained a bit here, but basically the idea is that it, uh, see there are different models, uh, uh, but roughly the same analysis. So. If you have uh, what's called timestamping, you know when the message was sent. Then you know which is the most recent message. You use it. Otherwise, just use which is which came the which has received most recently, and so on. So then uh, you can allow for data loss. Some packets never reached. Some messages never reached, and so on. Some under suitable conditions, uh, roughly the same thing works for all these models. Huh? No, no, I'll come to that. It's not, 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 not necessarily important. So I'll uh, put some condition later. So one is the set of indices that got updated at time n, and the rest remain the previous value. And if uh, the simplest case, if tau is bounded, then there will be ex another extra error term uh, corresponding to say h of x t minus tau and h of x t. That will be. Uh, I'm assuming the iterates are bounded. Uh, that that's uh, that needs a separate proof. But suppose the iterates are bounded, but uh, then one can show that uh, over the time interval uh, or any kind of finite time interval, the error will be small because uh, it's getting scaled by a n. So if it's a bounded delay, asymptotically the effect vanishes. This is actually slightly somewhat misleading because delays are a problem, and this is purely asymptotic. So if you want to worry about finite times, uh, additional analysis will be needed. And the uh, important thing is, if see, so the delays, at least for the mathematical analysis, delays under reasonable assumptions do not pro, uh, cause much of a difficulty. But uh, the asynchrony does, the wind does. You are not updating everything, so you get a limiting ODE is something like this: some diagonal matrix with non-negative values on the diagonal sitting in front. So the intuition. So basically, you just uh, some kind of a, uh, on each interval, I, will, I, uh, I put indicator of which uh, components were uh, whether that component was updated or not, and then go to some v star limit essentially, which gives you this kind of uh, ODE where lambda j t. So j -th component will correspond to in some sense intuitively the instantaneous relative frequency of update of j. This becomes more transparent in this, uh, reinforcement learning algorithms where the asynchrony comes from the fact that you are running a Markov chain and at time if at time n, if xn is i, you update only the ith component. So it's a single turn, the yn is a single turn. And then this lambda t is just the deterministic matrix with uh, the stationary distribution on the diagonal. But more generally, one has to allow for the differing rates at which you are updating components. In the previous slide, you had xi n depended on the graph, right? Previous one. Yeah. So each x, each xi n i on the graph, right? Yeah. So, and then I thought each xi was an R, R D value, right? Yeah. No, no. But I said that uh, this, uh, this, this I said uh, uh, R, and then the footnote says R D is possible. It saves the one subscript. That's fine, but yeah. but i is in the i is in the graph. I is in the graph. Yeah. It's what a scalar is, for x1 t, x2 t. The graph is like hard. Yeah.
No, no. So this is. So this, uh, there's no averaging here. Averaging is uh, actually that's the third part of my talk. Uh, I include the averaging component. Right now, just distributed computation. There's no. Oh, this lambda t. The stack size going infinity, right? N is going infinity. What is that? Okay. So I think needs one more figure. Maybe I can remove those. So I have this uh, time scale T0, T1, etc. It starts crowding because N is going to zero, but it will still go to infinity. And then I, inter I have this interpolated trajectory linear a piecewise linear trajectory and I compare that with a moving window with the OD initiated here. And the idea is that as you move the window, the difference will get they approach each other. And this is the limit I'm taking. So, Yeah, so I, are, I is the index of the node. Right. And you're letting little n go to infinity. So the, the outside, right? Yeah, little n go to infinity. But I'm, I'm saying basically, the ODE approximation is on a moving window. <coughs> so you fix some t. So this is some tn, say, on this interpolated. And you take the t, say, kn far enough so that uh, on the algorithm time scale is approximately capital T. And then you slide this window. D cross N, N cross N, yeah. Oh, did I say D cross N? Oh, then that's a mistake, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Where is that? Oh, yeah, that should have been kept in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so some, uh, there are two cases where it doesn't matter at all. One is gradient descent because uh, you just do the usual proof why gradient descent goes to a critical point. Plug in, you use H as a Lyapunov function. So, so sorry. So, uh, in this case, sorry, gradient descent. So, it's H is minus grad F, and then you use F as a Lyapunov function. You get something like this. So normally, uh, when you analyze the usual gradient descent, lambdas would have been one, but it doesn't matter. It will, again, affect the convergence rate, but won't affect the fact that it converges as long as they're bounded away from Z. And what one needs, so this is the kind of condition one needs, this is a relative frequency, the number of times I was updated till N divided by N should remain bounded away from zero almost surely. Can this new I comma N is a kind of like a local clock for i, the number of times i updated its own thing. Now, the other case where it works is useful in dynamic programming, I mean, this reinforcement learning algorithms where hx is of this form, fx minus x, and f is often, not always, but sometimes a contraction with respect to the max norm. And then also what you get is something like this, some time dependent, just after some manipulation, you get a, another contraction with a weaker contraction factor, but it has a common fixed point and you can just show that it goes to that. If F is a contraction uh, with that lambda t in place, I'll, the differential equation changes to this, where with F replaced by F tilde t, which is this. And working with F tilde t, you can still use the contraction arguments to show that it works. Yeah, so this I already mentioned that uh, it, uh, reinforcement learning is, for example, in uh, why and often are irreducible Markov chain on the index set. Sometimes uh, it's a controlled Markov chain where the index set is a state cross control. And then you use this what's called epsilon greedy policies. You sample, you just have to make, uh, ensure that every state is visited frequently, which usually is for irreducible cases free, but you also have to sample all controls at least with some small probability. This is the standard thing in AI, people call it exploration versus exploitation. You do not learn what you do not even try. 
often enough. No, with some probability. So the, uh, the the control case, what you do is the generally irreducibility ensures that you are visiting every state frequently anyway. But at each state, you have to. Uh, so what you do is you are trying to learn some optimal. Uh, suppose you are trying to optimize something. So uh, this algorithm will typically give you a guess for what's optimal. So with one minus F, probability one minus epsilon, you play that guess. Guess probability epsilon, you just choose one some arbitrary control at random uniformly. That ensures that everything is tried uh, often enough. No, that typically if you explore wildly, it's faster. I mean, if, if you are not trying to optimize, it's faster because the, the, then you are learning faster. You just sample everything. See, offline algorithms, that means you are not actually putting it, uh, you're running a machine based on it, you're just simulating it on a computer. You often have the freedom to sample, uh, your sampling distribution can be different from whatever you are going to finally see. Yes, so I thought about it right now. But in your previous example, you were hmm. doing uh, occasional sampling of different states. Getting... Yeah, that comes, that's for a different reason. That's not sampling, that's because they're different processors. Yes, sir, yeah. They may have their own. Yeah, so one worry that sometimes some yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the, the, condi uh, the conditions one puts on delays kind of, I mean, you assume it away in some sense. Yeah. So I said, uh, said bounded, you can relax it to some movement, conditional movement conditions. But that's a major problem in federated learning algorithms. Yeah, so another thing is to. You use that, uh, so this trick works. So you use sufficiently rapidly decreasing an and replace an by a new i n. This is important for a different reason. I knows new i n. So you can think of new i n as a local clock at processor i. So this is a fully, I mean, they don't even need to have a common clock. Once if you use a new i n instead of an, then it need not be any universal n. So it's a completely asynchronous algorithm. But it also has the advantage that if uh, if I impose this condition, I, this means I have to put conditions on a n. Then the uh, basically the just basically uh, I'm taking the ratio of the cumulative time on the clock of i relative to cumulative time of the clock and j. And if they agree asymptotically, then you just get a scaled ODE, and uh, that is the same trajectory, just slowed down d times. Yeah, it's possible I have put D everywhere where it should be N. Wait a minute. D in capital K. Yeah. Without loss of generality, unless stated otherwise. <laughs> yeah, so the N, the next slide will make it a little better. N can be, for example, 1 by N, 1 by 1, one by one plus N log N, but it cannot be 1 by N raised to 2 by 3. And you will see why. So suppose I take 1 by N, then the... Uh, the sum goes like a log roughly. So it's the ratio of the logs of the sums. And since new I, I, I assume that new i n by n is bounded away from zero. So essentially it's the limit of log n by log n because that's the dominant term. So the time scales match. Yeah, this is what I already said. So new i n is a local clock. So if your algorithm depends only on new i n, then the global clock, clock need not be there. If the can be completely. They can have their own, uh, it's just event driven. Only thing you have to, uh, in the model, you have to re uh, respect causality that you don't use something which didn't happen. Okay, just a little bit about federated learning, which is, has been a hot area for a while. There's, uh, here there's a central, uh, it's not completely distributed, it's a central server who just farms out computation, uh, usually, uh, usually stochastic gradient descent to multiple uh, process processors and they said their inf pulls information from them and uh, computes, uh, uh, aggregates it and sends back a message. Then they do their computation, go back and forth. And uh, so typically it's a periodic kind of uh, update. So every, after some fixed time T, the uh, server will do its job and so on. And but processors are asynchronous and heterogeneous. They may be doing other things at the same time or their machines may be different. So there's like a lot of, uh, issues there and there this stragglers is a big problem this is a big major, main problem there that there some of them may be very slow then because it's a periodic update uh, the 
coordinator will use whatever is available at that time and how to best do that so one thing is one standard thing thing is to replicate data so uh, if one guy defaults then there will be somebody else who also taking care of it another thing which was tried but it seems to be falling out of favor is to just also to encode data and uh, use coding theory basically to see send it in compressed form and then these people decode it the sense yeah so there are multiple variants like batch processing adaptive synchronization and so on and Whatnot. So this is a book by Gauri Joshi, which uh, small book which gives a good overview of the whole thing. Okay, so this is the third part. This is the main part. So I will talk about this statistically versus class advanced model. So here uh, there, there's some consensus here. You have about twenty minutes later. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <okay. laughs> Yeah, hopefully I finish this. So here there are two things. Uh, so there's this consensus part, which is the standard averaging, plus a stochastic approximation part. And this is from this paper. And uh, this is the interpretation. Can for... you all the neighbors? So you average, okay, so if, if the first term on the right was xin, it would be just everybody doing his own stochastic approximation. Here, what you do is instead of using your own iterate, you average over your neighbors. PAs are given. given. Yeah. I mean, it's a gossip algorithm, basically. This, this opinion dynamics, etc. they also use it. In fact, I think I mentioned that later. Yeah, so this is a gossip component. It's pure averaging. And so if you just, uh, by itself, it will just give you stationary expectation of uh, the initial condition. And it goes back to degroot. And the second is the learning component. And that, that's basically stochastic approximation. It's on a slower time scale. So the important thing here is that this I already mentioned, the time scale stuff. But the important thing is that the learning is on a slower time scale. So the, uh, so the intuition is that uh, gossip forces the address to the set of its fixed points, namely it's a one-dimensional um, subspace of constant vectors you are averaging. And the, uh, so by, uh, that's what the basically consensus algorithms do. But uh, once you combine it with this non other stochastic approximation, what it does is to force that ODE to remain on the invariance of, on the, set of fixed points. So set of fixed points in this model basically is just the constant vectors, which means these algorithms, the, suppose the, the stochastic approximation is a gradient descent, it will converge to a common local minimum. If it's non-convex, it will go to, if it's convex anyway, they, they go to the unique minimum from the convex. But if it's, even if it's non-convex, typically there's nothing to force them to agree asymptotically. This ensures that they go to a common local minimum. This was actually what the uh, Chisiklis was doing. And I should mention that um, Chisiklis' work and a lot of the work in this is, does not follow the ODE approach, but uh, I feel ODE is more intuitive here. Because it's like a part of perturbation of an ODE. I'll maybe return to that. But what you get is the limiting ODE is just an average over the neighbors with respect to stationary distribution of P. So, Finally, all, uh, all agents follow the same ODE, same trajectory. So over that moving window, they will follow, uh, asymptotically follow a common trajectory of this ODE. So it's kind of a dynamic consensus. And if the algorithm is converging anyway, all of them converge to the same point. So there are similar things in opinion dynamics, etc., and uh, dynamics of robotics. So usually it's more of what, uh, just the first part. But uh, the robotics application is dynamic in the sense that you want them to move together, but not just move along a time-dependent trajectory. They're not converging anywhere, but in a unified manner. So this is uh, for particular for optimization so was survey by Angelia Nidich. In fact, I depended a lot on that. But again, it's 2015 and it's a fast-moving area. She herself has done a lot more of that. 
So this, uh, there are variants, so I just mentioned one. There's another, uh, another book which does uh, similar things, more, more from a signal processing point of view. But uh, so you can take the average and then plug in the average and so on, multiple variations. Okay, so uh, you can also poll po po uh, the neighbor and so on. So they can be instead of just averaging your PIJ, pick a neighbor and take your average with the neighbor. And one such scheme is this. So xi n plus one is y i j n. So the basically each one does his own gradient descent, but y i j n is just half of his own value and that of the person who was polled. Another so basically uh, okay I think I skip some parts so with an independent Poisson clock you pick one i a single i i picks a single neighbor uniformly from the neighbors and uh, then they jointly perform this iterate using the average value of their previous iterates as in previous condition so this leads to uniform distribution. So see, many times uh, people, uh, machine learning people want to average with respect to uniform distribution because they're trying to minimize empirical loss on empirical risk measures, which are uh, one by n sum of some functions over some parameter. So there are just uh, sums of functions of separate variables. So they, they need to need uniform distribution basically because it's empirical mean. So uh, there's a lot of work trying to get uniform distribution in the limit. All I, I, I ensured earlier was consensus, not to, not necessarily to. Sorry, but even for this model, this XN has a, a, a big value in R, right? Yeah, uh, so they can be in R, and nothing uh, depends on there being in R. Uh, consensus means uh, all the components, components are the same number. No, no, component, each, uh, each component, no, component need not be same, but each component will be same across the processors. So the vectors agree. So for example, the limit is uh, x infinity is say vector one, two, three. That means the first component of everybody converges to one, second component of everybody converges to two and so on. So you have a limiting ODE and everybody is going to limiting. Yeah, and uh, if it converges to a same, same uh, limit. But limit is not a constant. I think it came from this economics people, D group, as it was opinion dynamics. Actually, he was a statistician. It's nothing to do with the, all the vertices having the same opinion. Right? Yeah, asymptotically, they have the same opinion. That's the idea. Yeah, so. Yeah. yeah. So in general, uh, if you want a particular stationary distribution, you can cook up P to be the metropolis Hastings kind of matrix. But that's so it's often that has self loose, so it need not be the fastest thing. There's also for uh, doubly stochastic for uniform, there's also a synchron algorithm. Start with any stochastic matrix and keep alternatingly averaging rows and columns, or sorry, normalizing rows and columns, it will converge to a doubly stochastic. Okay, so this is a generalization of this. You consider a time varying thing. And there are some people who did this. This is Angelia Nerici and her student Beru Sturi. They fished out some very old probability theory. So say that pi n is an absolute probability sequence for this uh, uh, time dependent sequence pn of transition mat matrix. If pi n satisfies the uh, uh, sort of backward backward column graphication kind of in the discrete set. But uh, the uh, difficulty here is that you, you're start, uh, at least in principle, starting at plus infinity and going coming back. It's not free. So we, we define this as an absolute uh, probability sequence if, uh, if pi n transpose is pi n plus one transpose pn. Okay. And then every pn has an absolute prob probability sequence was proved by Blackwell. And if Pn is said to be ergodic, if uh, starting from n to product from n to capital N, as capital N goes to infinity, has this uh, uh, rank one limit. If that is so, then the ergodic case Pn is a unique absolute probability sequence. That's uh, proved by Kalvogarov. Okay, or should I repeat? 
we will just go over it once. So you think of this backward equation going on for all the all time. Okay. So it's not obvious that makes sense, but uh, Kolmogorov defined that if there, there are pines satisfying this, he calls it uh, absolute priority sequence. Blackwell proved that there exists one. And in the special case where PN is ergodic in this sense, in the sense, sense that the product from N to capital N of the transition matrices uh, converges to a rank one matrix as capital N goes to infinity, then PN is the unique absolute priority sequence. And then Berus Turi proved that there's some kind of a time dependent tracking of rank one. And basically, consensus of a, but the, what you agree on varies, uh, just tracking a time dependent average. Because this is this from n naught to n. Actually, yeah, it's a bit messy, but it. So as you move n naught, that quantity will change. So this is what you have for the time dependent case. And there's some sufficient conditions for rigorosity. Go back to 1977. So another thing for computing arithmetic means is push some algorithm. This is also clever. So you do xi n plus one, just you take, this is just for, uh, there, there's no learning component here. This was proposed only for average. So xi n plus one is some more neighbors of uh, incoming neighbors. This is a directed graph. So incoming uh, neighbors, actually it's a uh, time dependent directed graph. So xi n plus one is some, uh, some more incoming neighbors at time n of xjk by, the out degree divided by the out degree. Y, yn is similar for yj. X, xi is a vector. yi is a scalar. You start xi as before starting with initial condition xi zero. You start yi zero, uh, just one. Take the ratio, it goes to the average. Okay, so this was the, came, from, came from computer science community. This is Kempo, Dobra, and Gerko, and this is a high profile conference, Fox. And, 2003, and it was extended. So uh, as I said, it was on, in particular on a complete graph. These people extended to much more general scenario, uh, cases. A lot of people, including Sisyclis. Now, just, I will just describe uh, quickly a general scheme. If uh, there's a changing graph topology, simply by putting psi i j n which is an indicator. It's a one if J communicates with I at time N, zero otherwise. And again, I'll make standard assumptions and delays and steps. So I just now I had new N comma I, I make it new N comma I comma J. So I'm also accounting for this. And then you get basically some time kills for your version of the sum of AJ. Now the convergence rates will depend on the graph and there's some analysis by these people. So for specific graph structures, they derive some kind of results about convergence rates. As I said, I'm giving a survey, so I'm not saying much about everything. Any question? Okay, so this is a, a variation. Now I'm allowing P to depend on the current iterate, P sub X. Okay, suppose I assume that P sub X uh, for each X is a transition matrix which is irreducible. And uh, I guess I have to assume that it's uh, left is in X and so on. Yeah, I did mention it. Then you get the, uh, again, same origin as before, but now Pi also depends on X. And this can, you can use to advantage. For example, one case is when HI is gradient descent and I choose Pi XI to be proportional to the basically Gibbs distribution, which penalizes uh, high values of f. So it will const. The idea is that uh, it, there's a varying weight on different, each, each, com each processor is doing a gradient descent, but you modulate and you take a linear combination of their uh, iterates, but you are modulating the weights and you are rewarding the person who's getting a better performance. You are rewarding the processor who has a better performance. Yet another generalization. So I, I get rid of that averaging and put some fi. That means I have some in the background, some algorithm yn plus one fxn. And suppose it converges to its sets of set of it, fixed points of f. 
Okay, then the above algorithm by the same logic will confine the differential equation to the fixed points of F. Okay, sorry. Yeah, and then um, you analyze it con 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 uh, confined to F and uh, this uh, one of uh, I did with one of my students. And a further generalization is instead of that F, I can put another stochastic approximation there, but with on a faster time scale, which means uh, see if I have two time, uh, two time scales defined by slip sizes AN and BN, and AN by BN goes to zero, then BN is faster. And what uh, this is also some other work with a PhD student this time. And that was, uh, uh, there's something called boiled extra Hahn algorithm for distributed, uh, uh, rather it's an algorithm for projection on intersection of convex sets. So if you're in projecting on intersection of uh, subspaces, you just do alternating projection, it works, it doesn't work with convex sets. So th there's a algorithm separately found by Boyle and Dijkstra and a little later by Hahn. And uh, <laughs> this is called boiled extra Hahn algorithm. So you, we do a kind of a distributed version of it on a faster time scale. And what we achieve this way is we get the projected stochastic approximation, which, which is another popular algorithm. So the projection part is distributed and done on a faster scale iteratively. So it doesn't have to be computed in a centralized fashion. Okay, so this is, uh, I think I'm doing well. this probably close to the end. Maybe the end, I'm not sure, but yeah, so see, let me just uh, introduce some more jargon. When uh, differential equations, uh, differential equation theory, there are two kinds of perturbations considered. One is this. This is one, and the other is x dot t. So here, epsilon is small. So you analyze these in the epsilon going to zero limit. So what happens is that actually is perhaps more convenient to put one by epsilon here. So this will be a fast time scale. So the way you analyze it is you, the first time scale will see the slow time scale as frozen, basically it's moving too slowly. So plug in some y here and analyze this. And suppose x converges to some lambda y, then you plug in lambda y here because this is fast, so it's sort of more or less converged from point of view of the slow time scale. And solve y dot t equal to g of lambda y t y t if it converges to y star then the, they will jointly converge to lambda y star y star. This is the convergent case. You can do more complicated things also. So this is called singular perturbation because uh, if, uh, I, yeah, maybe I should, if I had put epsilon here, one by epsilon there, it would be more obvious kind of, uh, this some kind of state space collapse here because, yeah, okay, maybe it's better with this. If once I average, I, I, I look at this first, I average with respect to this, then I can forget this. I average this with respect to the asymptotics of this, then this is gone and I have a single lower dimension object to analyze. So this is called singular perturbation. And here uh, there's no, the dimension doesn't change as epsilon goes to zero. This, so what I'm doing now is uh, more like this, which is a regular perturbation. So this has already been used in stochastic approximation for two time scale algorithms in, for example, reinforcement learning. So you learn the value function on first time scale and do the opt control on a slower time scale, et cetera. This is less common, but this is actually a regular perturbation. And uh, the thing is, can one do more? So this is, I just pointed out one, one article. So I, I talked about the case where the, they are converging to a fixed point, but uh, they, have, they basically show that uh, you get averaging of this with respect to an invariant measure of the first scale. That's what you expect. So 
such more general regular differential equations can they be leveraged for algorithmic purposes that's the thing i want to pose basically i am not sure i have not seen any example of it but uh, it's possible so i think that's it i just want to mention that after my phd i spent a year in printer and i picked up a smattering of dutch this is one of the words i remember thank you so much any questions in your graph model the graph model uh, you have xi is equal to some something depending on the neighbors right how general can your function f be that's driving the scheme which is i'm looking at differential equation it can be i mean it should be lipschitz well, lipschitz the linear okay. growth for well positedness lipschitz in, in in the variable x yeah so you can't have things like uh, uh, look at i and look at the number of triangles j is connected to you can't have things like that that, that may be hard to judge lipschitz or not right lipschitz okay yeah, uh, yeah discrete objects i don't know and there are generalizations of uh, differential equations to something called differential inclusions one could Extend this. Is this like a true ODE on the on the graph, or just it's an ODE on on the real axis? ODE in a Euclidean space. Uh, graph is uh, associated with the indices. Okay. So, so optimization people worry a lot about you know mirror descent method, Frank Wolf method, all these different ways of doing descent to expedite the convergence. Mm -hmm. So has some of that come into stochastic approximation now, or? I think it has. I'm not. I don't offhand. I don't remember. This is more but machine I've learning. The, from machine learning community, I've seen. Okay. Definitely the um, Nestor method people have used. Other also probably have. So, sorry, which uh, method? Other methods, the mirror descent, etc. I, I think also yeah. have been. Yeah. I see. Okay, but have you not? So, can you say that they are better than these or faster in some sense numerically? No, no. Stochastic approximation uh, uh, won't be better than the deterministic. No, no, no. Yeah. Stochastic approximation with these kind of mirror descent kind yeah. of methods, as opposed to kind of vanilla gradient descent. Yeah, they're likely to be. That will See, be. The true. reason gradient descent is popular is not because it's the fastest method, but it scales well with dimension. See, for example, in moderate dimension, nobody will use it. In optimization people would use quasi Newton or something, but they don't scale very well. in a very high dimensional any other questions if not let's then thank the speaker again